Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1981 horror sequel, The Final Conflict. Now, this is also known as Omen 3, The Final Conflict, but it was released in theaters as The Final Conflict because it was intended to just be the final Omen film. I guess there was some plan in the works for an Omen 4, but it never got made. I really genuinely do feel the intent was for this to be the final film. Um, that's why it even says like the final chapter in the Omen trilogy when it comes to a lot of the advertisements for the movie. And I have a very conflicted uh, history with this movie. When I first saw the film, I thought it was lame. I thought it was really terrible. I hated it. I thought it was just a complete and total letdown on every front. The second time around, I didn't hate it as much, but I still thought it was pretty bad. I guess third time around was a charm because I saw it fairly recently again and I had some fun with it. Now, I would say that it's honestly mediocre. It's very meh at best. And it is disappointing because there's a lot of potential here and it's never fully realized. And there's just a lot of elements when it comes to the script in particular that are really bad, that really hold the film back. But it has more merits than I, than I originally remembered it having. And as a result, I can kind of watch this as a time waster now. And I could kind of see what some people are seeing when it comes to this movie, where they're like, you know what, it wasn't that bad. I've definitely seen a lot worse sequels than The Omen 3. It's directed by Graham Baker. And I think Graham Baker did a great job with it. Uh, he definitely was trying to do more of a film visually that was more akin to what Richard Donner brought to the movie in the original Omen in the first film. And I think that was a good approach. Uh, it, it's definitely less B movie exploitation. Uh, when it comes to the shot selection or, or the framing or kind of how it's presented as uh, Damien Omen two was at times it's a little more nuanced, a little bit more layered when it comes to the direction a little bit more deliberate uh, when it comes to the way that he shot certain scenes versus others. It's not really a film that has this very just kind of, I wouldn't say predictable, but just very um, bland uh, sense of visual style that just kind of runs together. Um, I think it's a film that has some really great looking shots in it that, I do genuinely feel uh, really add a lot to the film, like the sequence uh, with the fox hunt. I think that scene is shot brilliantly. I think it's a really great uh, sequence. And I think there's a few other shots throughout the film that are also shot uh, masterfully and, and are well-crafted and very well done. And I think overall it is, it's a, it's a, it's a well-directed movie. Is it, like the best, most spectacular, amazing, uh, jaw dropping direction. No, but it, there's definitely a lot of fine, uh, tuning and finely crafted, uh, 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 visual flair and style at work here. And you could definitely tell the guy behind the camera is very capable. And I think with the Omen three, as inconsistent as it is, I don't think you can really point to very many scenes in this film directing wise that are inconsistent or not uh, uh, up to the, the usual par that you might expect for uh, a theatrical feature. So, yeah, I, I, I do feel that the direction in this film, other than maybe like the score by Jerry Goldsmith and the performance by Sam Neill is one of the best aspects of the movie. 
overall. The screenplay by Andrew Birkin. Here's the thing about this script. It has some elements of it that are excellent, that are really good. Uh, I think the opening of the film, I, I think like the first like 10 minutes or so, I, I think is tremendous. Like the opening of the movie that starts out with this assembly line where this guy's looking through different bits of debris and finds one of the seven daggers of Maggie Doe. And then it cuts to this guy at a pawn shop who finds the rest. He buys them, then puts them up for auction. They get sold to the highest bidder. Then the, the guy who won them at the auction is doing his research, finds out what they are, finds this uh, priest uh, and gives it, him the daggers and then the monks this this uh hidden uh group of monks who have been waiting for this moment who are seeing the prophecies coming uh uh true and things are starting to align for the 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 second coming and they get the daggers and it's just a really great way to set things up for the film and it also does a good job setting up Damien Thorne. When you see him as an adult, there's this fake advertisement for Thorne Industries and he calls it trite and terrible. And it shows him as a mean spirited, egotistical, uh, just devilish uh, CEO. And that's exactly what, the audience and exactly what you're expecting when it comes to an adult Damien Thorne. So script gets an A for establishing things and setting up the story. And even when it comes to the first kill, like the first moment where Damien uh, utilizes his uh, devilish powers, like the scene with the U S ambassador for Britain, uh, and his suicide is one of the most impactful, just viscerally intense sequences, not only in this franchise, not only in this franchise, but honestly that I've seen in a film because of just how brutal and ruthless it is and creative the way that he uses the, the typewriter tape and sets it up into some kind of pre saw like tr contraption to blow his face off when somebody opens the door to his office. Um, it really starts off with a bang, literally. And then you get to know more of the monks and you see their plan. And then the moment when the first monk tries to assassinate Damien at the TV station and fails spectacularly, the screenplay really starts to go off the rails and it wastes all the momentum. And that's just, that is, it's just so disappointing. A and that's really what prevents this film from being anything other than average because the monk aspect of it is so badly mishandled. The way that the writer writes these monks is as if it's a total farce, as if it's a complete, an utter comedy like it's a joke the monks are so hapless they're so bumbling and so pathetic that they might as well be the three stooges or the keystone cops keystone monks the three stooges and monk dumb like it's just so embarrassing in a lot of ways like this is the 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 group that's supposed to save humanity, that's supposed to stop the Antichrist from taking power before the second coming, it's these idiots? I, God had all this time to handpick the best of the best, and th this is the best that he could come up with? Man, we're screwed. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just a really puzzling and just mind-boggling writing choice maybe it's because it's trying to be unexpected okay you expect these monks to be experienced but they're inexperienced and they're no match at all for damien okay that is unexpected but 
it just ruins any sense of tension or suspense when it comes to scenes involving Damien and these monks because you know how it's going to end because they're not even remotely close to a match for him. And it also makes Damien look weak in comparison because it's like, okay, this is the best that he has to fight and face off against is the Keystone monks. And I, I bet you're wondering like, okay, how are they the Keystone monks? All right, I'll tell you. Uh, so the first monk, he's up on, uh, it's not really a railing. It's more like a lighting rig at the TV studio. And he just inexplicably just trips and falls and then gets burned alive. There's your first monk. Um, if it was a f the first time, the first attempt, and the first monk failed in idiotic fashion, that'd be one thing. But it just continues. And it just gets worse and worse as it goes on. Um, the next two monks, they think they've outsmarted Damien and cornered him somewhere in the mountains in some kind of ruins. But Damien tricks them easily and they get trapped in a grate. They get trapped under a grate in a hole and are basically left to die. Uh, the next two monks, they seem to be the most intelligent. They come up with the best plan uh, during the fox hunt. They set things up where Damien's going to chase after a dead fox and get cornered somewhere by them. And then they're going to tag team uh, Damien. But when once they have Damien cornered, they're just taking their sweet ass time, pulling out their daggers really slowly, uh, sauntering towards him, not really seemingly showing any sense of urgency. And so Damien just quickly dispatches the both of them, sends one monk falling off his horse to his death off a bridge because he just takes control of the horse easily and makes it buck the guy off. And the other guy, he already seems like he's just scared shitless the moment that he's decided to even go on this quest and the as soon as he takes out the dagger he's got this look on his face like he shit his pants and so damien just just sends the hunting dogs after him and even the line of dialogue even the way that damien reacts when he sees this guy is like Psh, get him like, like even I mean, i'm like really really even Favre de Carlo, who is the leader of these monks, even he isn't a match for Damien. Even he's a, an idiot. He stabs the wrong guy. He stabs Kate's son at the end instead of Damien and just gets easily overpowered by Damien at the end of the movie. So it's like these monks just come across like completely pointless in the end because of how they're written. I don't know. Have one of them stab Damien and he actually gets hurt for a little bit. Doesn't succeed in killing him, but at least maybe he leaves a mark. Maybe they they get closer each time. Like, oh, they almost got him, but then he finds a way to get away. Or, I don't know, maybe Damien uses his demonic powers to cause other animals or other things to happen that causes them to fail instead of them just failing for the most part. Because they're incompetent, that that probably would be a better idea from a writing standpoint. But no, instead, Keystone monks. And I just, I just don't understand. I don't get it. I do not understand that thought process. Also, I think the writer did a bad job establishing that it's the Armageddon. Like some little news broadcast and an advertisement in the beginning isn't a good enough job. Like. The streets don't look like they're from Escape from New York. There's not people starving and, and struggling everywhere. There's not crime running rampant in the streets. So much of the film just takes place in London, and it just seems like it's just every other average day in London. Like, it doesn't even seem like it's that frantic, that crazy, that insane. Like, if the Armageddon is happening and the Second Coming is upon us, you would think that, that things would be way more intense and way more crazy than they are when it comes to what's happening uh, in the streets and what's happening outside of Damien's offices and that you don't get that. And that makes things less uh, uh, impactful too, because if this is supposed to be like the Armageddon is the end times, like you would think that 
there'd be something that would reflect that more. And when the second coming happens, it's kind of like, why? You're like asking, like, why did why did God like, yeah, I'm going to come now. I'm going to come to Earth now. I'm going to return now. Like, doesn't even look like he needed to because it didn't even look like it was that bad. Um. Also, because of the fact that. You never really show Damien's full scope of his powers. That also is a problem because, OK, he's the he's now the an adult and now he has all this power but you never really see him utilize it worldwide. You never really see him establish his strength and his power uh, fully because he's only the U S ambassador for a short amount of time. Like it's almost like this was shoehorned into being the final conflict and they didn't really necessarily want it to be the final conflict and kill off Damien at the end. They wanted to set things up for a fourth film. So then he could become like the president or something and fully established a new world order, but that never happens. So it, it, it is something that does definitely disappoint when it comes to how Damien is established, when it comes to him rising to power. And I think it would have been interesting as well to maybe add in some kind of physical uh, ailment or something that shows him losing power because it would have made his desperation when he's trying to kill the Nazarene all the more powerful because all you see is him just looking normal, right? His reign, not having any problems, maybe make him age, maybe make him, uh, uh, physically altered. Maybe starts to lose, uh, uh, you know, some body parts or maybe he, becomes more demonic, more, you know, visibly demon like or something. I don't know. Like just something other than oh, I'm losing power, but then you never really see the effect of that. And it doesn't even seem like he loses that much power by the end of the movie. So, those are definitely things that I think should have been handled better when it comes to the script as well. But there are other things that the script does well, and it's not just in the opening like first few sequences. I, I don't mind the love story that starts to bud and blossom between Damien and Kate, whether or not it was real or not, whether or not Damien actually had any real love for her. I, I think the script did a good job establishing that Kate felt that it was real. So then when she has to stab Damien uh, in the end in order to save Earth and save her son... Um, that led to some compelling, uh, uh, elements of the narrative and the story. And I liked the dynamic between Damien and Kate's son and how Damien is starting to rub off on Peter and Peter's becoming more and more like a protege of the Antichrist. And I like how the writer showcases Damien's desperation when he's trying to find the Nazarene and sets things up with his disciples to kill uh, every uh, son that was born at a certain time frame. And I like that it's tastefully done. And you, a lot of the deaths, in fact, all of the deaths happen off screen, but they're still equally as horrific because you just imagine what's happened, what, what's actually happening like a baby getting crushed by a car in traffic uh, a baby in the ICU getting its oxygen turned off by the nurse um a baby getting suffocated and drowned by a priest during a, a baptism gone horribly awry uh a baby getting killed by its own mother with an iron, like th these are some pretty intense, uh, um, things. And, and I think the script doesn't shy away from being like really crazy and wild with it, but in a way where it's not too gratuitous and too over the top and tasteless. So I, I appreciate that. And I think the script did a good job handling uh, that complicated 
sort of complex aspect uh, of of uh, of the script. And I also think there's some certain awe when it comes to the second coming that's handled well, like the scene of the observatory where the stars all align, and then there's this like big bang of sorts, and it's official that the second coming is here. And I actually like the ending. I've warmed up to the ending. In the past, I didn't like the ending at all because there is no real final conflict. But I think it would have been silly if there was. Like, if you saw this 10-foot-tall Jesus fight the Antichrist, like, it would be pretty ridiculous. So I think it was a better choice by the writer to be more subdued, to be a bit more subtle with it and just have Jesus Christ show up. And then Damien got stabbed in the back by Kate. And then Damien has his last words. You're like, you've won nothing Nazarene. Like that, that I think that's better than like some kind of fight between Jesus and the Antichrist. I think that would really get to the point of sheer silliness. So I think that was actually a, the right call to make. So I don't have a problem with that. I actually like the way it ends now because I'm just thinking about how absurd and how ridiculous it would be with some actor playing Jesus getting into a sword fight with Damien Thorne or something at the end of the movie. Like it would just be like, okay, this is just, this is, this is getting into just absolute cartoon territory. But um, yeah, like like I said, the script, it's got its issues, but it's also got some elements that really do work and they work very well. And that's what makes the things that hold it back from living up to its full potential so frustrating because you're like, this is really good. This is really good. It establishes things so well, and then it just drops the ball and it it just, it is, it's just very disappointing. But because those elements are good enough, it makes it so it's not a complete and total disappointment. The cast, I think, is pretty good. Uh, I think the biggest, uh, uh, strongest element of the cast, member of the cast, is definitely Sam Neill as Damien Thorne. I know Sam Neill, he doesn't think it's that be- great of a performance. He thinks he was too young. It's not one of his better roles. I disagree. I think it's one of his better performances of his career. I think he's very charismatic. He's very charming, but also equally as conniving and devilish and just disturbing and twisted and chilling when he's asked to be, which is why I wanted to see more of this evil side of Damien in, in the film. But what you get, definitely leaves an impression like the scenes where he's just monologuing and, and praying to his, his, his father, the devil. Uh, Those are scenes that make a chill run up your spine. And just the way he has like that devilish grin and able to use his eyes to, to, to really make it look like there's no soul in them. And, um, yeah, it was a really, I thought it was a great performance. He did a good job playing the charming, facade of Damien Thorne, the the diplomat, the ambassador who's good with people and is very socially uh, capable and seems like he's actually a nice guy. He's very well read, but then also the guy who's killed the Nazarene. I don't care how you do it. Find every uh, child, every I mean, every bo- boy that was born around this time and kill him. Like, I definitely do feel that Sam Neill did a great job just playing the, the adult Damien. I really bought the transition. I bought that you had the young boy from the first omen and then the teenager. And then that, 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 that boy and that teenager would grow up to be this, this Damien Thorne. Lisa Harrow, I thought was honorable as well. She did a, a good job as Kate. Um, The script didn't give her a whole lot to work with, but what she had to work with, I felt she did a good job with it. 
especially the scenes with her and Damien, uh, with uh, Sam Neill. They had some really good romantic chemistry and they had some good sparks. And there's a reason for that. They actually were romantically involved throughout the production. So much so that uh, Lisa actually had a, a child with uh, Sam um, later on. And Rosano Brazi, he's there as father to Carlo. I would say he's the best monk out of all of them, but that's not saying much. Uh, Don Gordon is Harvey Dean. I, I like that performance. The guy was just sniveling and slimy, just perfectly encapsulated the kind of personality and the kind of guy who would just slither around the Antichrist uh, and do anything to save his own ass and also be able to uh, reap the rewards of, of being the the right-hand man of, of Damien Thorne. Um, and uh, the actress who played his wife, Lee Louine Willoughby, was also uh, good, too, in the few scenes that she was in, especially the scene where she's tripping out and she's getting possessed by Damien and she looks at her baby and it's all deformed and she starts acting maniacally. Like I, I feel that that was a really effective scene in large part because of the way that she handled that sequence. Uh, Barnaby Holm, I also felt was, was, uh, was good as Peter Reynolds. I thought he had, uh, some good chemistry with Sam Neill in particular. Um, the rest of the actors who played the monks, like all of them are equally as hapless as the other Mark Boyle, Milo's Kreek, Tommy Duggan, Louis Mahoney, Richard Oldfield, and Tony Vogel. The rest of the cast, I mean, I only really want to mention like Mason Adams who played the U S president. Like the U S president was like in one scene, but the actor did a great job just playing such a just conniving, just, awful kind of friend like the just a very selfish self-serving guy which in a lot of ways is who the president is in real life so i i thought it was a very authentic performance um and uh robert arden i thought he was amazing in the few scenes he was in as the great ambassador of britain just the the scene where he he's aware of him getting possessed and he's just like incredulous about it and and just the way that he showed himself just being not himself anymore and just being driven by some unseen force and it was it was a it was a well uh, acted uh scene and good performance by by uh Robert Arden um the film also features some nice looking cinematography some good shots by Phil Mayhew and Robert Painter the editing by Alan Strachan, it's not stupendous or or um, on another level, but it's it's good. It works for the film. Uh, and I want to mention some of the other aspects of the production. Like I, I, I definitely want to mention the effects, guys. It's not a very effects-heavy film, but the effects that are there, I thought they were pretty efficient, pretty well done. The stunt work... Um, particularly the stunt of uh, the monk who falls off the bridge. Uh, that was that was a really good stunt. It was like crazy high fall too. So I want to give the the stuntman credit for that. Um, and I definitely want to give credit to the score. I mean, Jerry Goldsmith's score in this I thought was grand. I thought it was spectacular. I thought it was epic. Uh, I I've seen a lot of people point out that it's like too bombastic too over the top i thought it was fine and i thought it was a lot better than his score in damien omen 2 he was able to take more time with this one make it more personal make it a little bit more unique it's more operatic and i think that makes it a little more divisive but i love that about this film it should be epic it's about the second coming like it should be epic it should be grand it should be splendid it should be glorious and the main theme in particular i think is really uh uh fantastic and i, and I think it's honestly one of goldsmith's more underrated works overall and i could see why some people would find it to be a bit dull when it comes to the pacing 
I, I, I understand that completely because once it starts focusing on the monks and the various different ways that they meet their match or meet their demise, it's pretty slow because they're not established as any sort of threat. So then you're just sitting there just like, okay, great. All right. Is it a wait for these monks to fail again until we can get to the rest of the plot? Um, but yeah, it's one of those movies that I'm not going to sit here and call it underrated. I'm not going to say that it's a gem. I'm not going to say it's misunderstood. I totally get why somebody would say this just sucks or this is a bad film or they don't like it. Um, but I used to be in that boat and I, I, I thought it was all right. I, I think it's okay. And a lot of it has to do with Sam Neill and his just magnetic, just really powerful performance as, as Damien Thorne, the score by Jerry Goldsmith, the direction by Graham Baker and the elements of the script that are genuinely effective and strong. Uh, but it's still a, a, a film that will just really leave you conflicted at the end. I, I, it doesn't matter where you stand with the film. Like you're going to have some kind of conflict with the final conflict. Um, but anyway, that's my thoughts on the final conflict. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you later. See ya.